Okay, here we are. Another Spun Mafia episode. This time, we've got a really special guest, don't we, Ragu? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, someone that we got to meet together, learn together, uh, and um, now sitting on the other side of things where we're, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's great to be able to talk to Bruce as a peer. You know, yeah, that's um, right. So, so, Bruce, tell everybody who you are and what you do. Sure, I'm Bruce Etroff. Uh, I am uh, a private equity investor. Uh, I had my own firm for over 20 years called Higher Capital, and we actually merged our firm. So I had a little bit of experience last summer into a larger asset manager called Star Mountain Capital. But you know, we've been investing in, in growth businesses. That's how we got to meet Jeff and, and Raku. And, and you know, it's, it's a fun job because every day I, somebody walks into my office or now they walk into a, a Zoom meeting and, and you learn, wow, that's a really cool idea. So uh, it's been it's been a joy, but, but we should, and, and we're always learning. So we're we're going to learn something today as we talk about. It. <laughs> That's right. Well, and Ragu, you uh, you're you're a new person since the last time we did did a spun mafia. So tell everybody what you're up to, real quick. Yeah, you might have seen me last on the day that I sold. Talking to Jeff, actually sneak peek, we actually recorded it a week before it closed, <laughs> and luckily it didn't jinx it. And then Jeff. <laughs> Until, until close. So um, uh, I co-founded 44 um, with a couple of partners on um, January 1st, uh, 2015, one year and then one day after the non-compete ended, Bruce. Um, and, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, That's, it tends to be a, an important um, day for entrepreneurs. Um, and then um, met uh, um, a great set of folks over the summer as we were looking to see how to grow and um, met someone that I met because of Bruce. Um, in Colton King, who was um, at KRG Capital at the time, and now has his own uh, private equity fund um, with Mountain Gate Capital. Um, we immediately recognized each other, and he wished that he had been successful in acquiring us, um, initially at Ansira and then, um, and then Olson, um, and said, maybe the third time is the right time, and it was <laughs> for us. And we ended up closing on December 4th. And uh, since then, it's been a whirlwind, but it's been uh, a great several weeks meeting a bunch of new folks at Bounteous. Been going really well and look forward to a great year together. Awesome. Well, let, let's get into how we know Bruce. So so for those who don't know, if you haven't been keeping up with the, the podcast, um, Bruce and his firm Halyard uh, acquired SpunLogic in March of 2008. Um, and so- It's good timing that's, <laughs> for, for, for you. That's right. <laughs> Bruce, April 2008 was our best month ever as <laughs> Fair. I love it. Um, so Ragu and I were really, we've talked about this, but Ragu and I were really leading the charge on the acquisition process so that uh, Danny and Raj could keep running the shop. And uh, when we first met Bruce, it was an epic meeting in our minds. And so Ragu, I'm going to let you set that up. <laughs> I'm curious from, from Bruce's perspective. I don't, I, no, I don't even remember it, so don't worry. <laughs> right, okay. All right, Ragu, set the stage. So uh, we met in Chicago, and there was actually a direct marketing association. Oh, DMA, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that brought a lot of people up there. Stan, um, Stan, Stan, was, up there. Stan was probably there, yeah. Yeah, and I believe you had a suite at the Drake Hotel um, or a meeting room. But that was meeting room. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But it was set up with like. Well, I guess we we because we had we had already bought uh, you know uh, ten United and and during yeah. Impact, right so yeah so it was probably an engaged we we even so it, so it wasn't around like a conference table it was right, like right. casual furniture and we sit down and there was some a tiny amount of pleasantries and then Bruce started <laughs> rattling off like a machine gun a series of questions around uh, you know just you know, balance sheet growth, margins, why you do certain <laughs> things, why you're not in certain things. And we had prepped quite a bit, right? Um, you know, we were going to know about ourselves as well as we could. That was our job, right? So after a while, Jeff sort of started looking at me because it was a whole series of financial related questions and Jeff was deferring. And as I was started answering the question, as soon as Bruce realized that I was going to answer the question correctly, he cut me off and asked the next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Uh, so, hopefully, I've hopefully matured in my approach, but, uh, and that's part of it, right, is that you, you know, you hopefully get to a point where, because look, I always tell people when we're looking at buying businesses, we have to assume that we're getting the, you know, the, the gold laden story and that, 
you know, our job is to focus on, you know, 90% of the time is to focus on what could go wrong, right? Because, you know, when things are going well in business, everyone's happy, right? You know, lots of nice dinners and celebratory, but, you know, and that's part of it. But yes, to, you know, that you definitely caught me on a day where I can have that approach, where I can be pretty direct. <laughs> well, the great part about it is um, I had read a book a long time back and I had read it again, maybe a couple months before our meeting. Um, so Liar's Poker, there was this um, section in there about a guy with the nickname, the human piranha. Uh, <laughs> So for uh, most people think, you know, it's funny because my brother's in the, in the broader Wall Street business and he always used to say I'm the nicer brother, but I guess, you know, that, that day, you know. Well, well, you didn't say a single curse word at all. <laughs> so, so it was kind of unlike the book in that way. I mean, you know, but, but just sort of that nice aggressiveness and, and go, I'm like, wow. I, you know, and had you guys, had you guys met Stan yet? Had, or, or was that the first meeting already? Because I think Stan was usually doing reconnaissance, right? So. He softened you up, gave you the, the soft shoe and yeah, I think sold, so. the sold the vision. And they had the, the numbers guy with the eye shade come in. And... But, it, but right. it's a great entree into that. Um, honestly, I mean, you know, worst case, we didn't know the answers. I mean, right, right. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Well, you guys, you guys were very sharp. And so obviously, you know, the net of it is right. We obviously, you know, made an offer to buy the business. So, uh, you know, and that's one of the things I've learned over time. Is you, it's hard to read these meetings, right? Sometimes some of your worst meetings, even in the client side, right? Sometimes you think, okay, sometimes you have a good chemistry and you know it's good and it's going well. Other times you walk out, you think you're lost and you end up being the winner. So it, 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 until you get to know people a little bit better and know their style, that's obviously the benefit of, of, of us all working together. You know, then we get to know each other's style a little bit better. Yeah. And I, and I should point out too, the, these things don't always end up well in terms of relationships. And, and we've always thought very highly of you, Bruce and, and John and, uh, um, and, and, and likewise, likewise. I and mean, one of the things that I'm most proud about in Gates and this kind of, it's good, is that the number of children it spawned is, and, and you guys are just two of many. I mean, it's probably of all of our portfolio companies ever, this one has spawned the most entrepreneurs. Like if you think about it, if you look at actually the number of people that touched the gaze, who ended up being in their own business on some share of shorts, so about a dozen. Yeah. Which is actually, which is actually pretty impressive. Um, so, so you, so, so anyways, we're friends and we can speak honestly. That absolutely. meeting, we, we didn't dislike you in that meeting. We were just like, we came out of there and we're like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the only meeting we had where we were like, did we do great or did we do terrible? We, <laughs> we had no idea. And Ragu, you did all the heavy lifting. So, so that was, you know, but um, so I, I'm curious, Bruce, we've never talked about this from your side, as you guys were looking at spun logic and, and presumably other shops, right. um, you know, were there points where you're like, mm, I don't think it's these guys Were you were, were some of the partners, like, how did that go from your side? Yeah. I mean, it's, well, as you may recall, we were very focused on a digital component to the solution, right? 10 United was our broad agency. Direct impact was our uh, CRM data driven. And then we really felt like digital was such a key component. Um, and so, you know, we were just, what I always like to do is try to understand how well people know their business. U ultimately, for, especially for a platform build, we, re we actually rely on the management team to make sure, um, and we'll talk about that, you know, subsequent questions, you know, and it's the hardest thing for us to assess because everyone has to kind of work well together. And, and a, an M&A platform strategy is way harder to pull off than just an organic growth strategy. Because as you guys live through multiple times, you've got to put you know different companies, cities, cultures together. Um, but we like that you were you know young, driven, had just a good energy, had had landed some big clients in Atlanta, you know the Home Depot at the time, which is you know, a good hallmark for a small company. As you know, it's they're not easy you know clients to to reel in, um, and that's kind of you know one of the things we try to kind of separate really kind of companies that aren't ready, you know, have they kind of at least done, you know, gone to war with procurement and some of the other kind of structural issues you have when you're dealing with big business. Yep. Got it. Okay, good. Well, there's one other story that we, as Ragu and I were thinking about chatting with you. Um, I think Ragu, you guys went to Bruce's favorite restaurant. Is that right? Which one did we go to Ragu? Um, Roy's Hawaiian. Oh, Roy's Hawaiian. Yeah. Where was, where was that? Um, we might, I think we've gone twice, once in Atlanta, but the, this particular oh, in Atlanta. was on the water in San Diego. In San Diego, sure. That was probably another DMA. Yeah, it was another DMA. It was um, um, yourself and I and uh, 
um, Dave Grislak, if you remember him. Um, sure, Grislak, sure, yeah. Yeah, um, and Michael McCatherine, who a uh, client from Chick Fil A, we were all um, oh sure yeah you know, eating together, and um, as we were talking, I forget how many years into the um, acquisition we were, probably probably a couple years in, pretty well pretty well integrated and, and everything, and then one of the questions came up about um, the cruise, and, oh. <laughs> uh, and, and and all along at one point I forget somebody's answer early on was. Yeah, maybe that's something we'll think about, you know, bringing back, not, not, you know. And, uh, but, but, but we should pause and say that up until the sale, we had done, I think, seven or eight straight annual company trips. Absolutely. <laughs> just every year. And then we sold. Okay. Yeah. So it would be in January or February. So the fact that we sold in March, we had just had one. Right. So it wasn't even a point of discussion for, around the company until about like eight, nine, 10 months later. They're like, Hey, what about this year? You know, and we're like, ah, oh, you know, the financial crisis, you know, reset some things. But we're right, like, right. the first year, exactly. Because that was the, the teeth of the Lehman debacle, right? So, yeah. And so another year passes. And I think we were at, at, at Roy's um, enjoying that. And I, I brought that up and you, you were like, yeah, really, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, the cost or anything. It's like, uh, you know, I've got investors and if I'm telling them that I'm going to put all my human assets onto a bus filled with alcohol, drive it down to Florida, and on a cruise with more alcohol, and then have them come back, um, I'd be a complete idiot. So yeah, we're not going to be doing that anymore. Well, and, and not only that, so we, we actually did, so we had another company, another marketing company. You may, may remember we had a higher education marketing company in Hoboken, and we actually did a cruise around New York. And in the middle of our cruise, we had, you know, everybody in the company and then the tech people had come and they had brought their laptops. Actually, our, our main site crashed. And so the, the, the circle line driver was like, we're not going back. And the guys are like trying to scramble. Yeah, we had about uh, 18 minutes of downtime because of that cruise. So, you know, so <laughs> maybe we'll, we forgot we'll, to we'll, just, we'll, we'll divide and conquer next time, Regu. You, you'll, <laughs> yeah. do it, you'll do it in like segments. So now, now yeah. we know, Regu, you got to always ask the, the buyer, what's your feeling on annual company trips? <laughs> Yeah, that might have been a deal breaker. Um, yeah, you know, there's always the people that's like, you know, the right kind of buyer overpays because they think they're too confident about the future. And then you have the people that understand risk like Bruce, who pay the <laughs> right amount. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And then look, that's, and, and look, we're in a crazy world today, right? You guys are, you're, are dealing with it. Um, you know, it's funny because, it, you know, we obviously all lived through OA together and that seemed to be more in concert, right? The, the, the economy was going through a tough time. The world was going through a tough time. And, you know, everybody's business suffered. It wasn't surprising that we had a tougher year, you know, as we, but we worked our way out of it. And, you know, the thesis, right. Today, we've got this kind of crazy backdrop of the pandemic. You know, we've had this obviously unstable situation in DC that hopefully will work itself out. And then the markets are on fire and it's not just, you know, the private markets that we deal with. Public markets, you probably, you know, I don't know if you guys follow what's going on, what's called SPACs, yeah. you know, these kind of public vehicles. It's, it, it is a little bit crazy. We all know that it's got to end somehow and it's not going to be pretty. So, I mean, I think, Raghu, you were smart to, you know, find a good partner. It, you know, it's, it's, it's always a hard call as to when to sell or when to kind of bring in capital because you no one's ever a fortune teller. You know, never know exactly. But, you know, you do it when it feels right to yourself and when, you know, you're ready to make that kind of personal business. So, so Bruce, honestly, part of the thesis, when I look at the macro picture for what happened at Engagement, we'll dive into some other right. details that we did a lot of details during these fun mafia things earlier in the year. But yeah, I learned a lot. I didn't, I didn't even know about that Joe Kaufman situation. We'll talk about that another day, but <laughs> I, learned, I learned a ton. <laughs> um, but, but we look about it and we're like, hey, we had these clients in Atlanta um, as fun up through, you know, 08. Um, fast forward to 2013. Uh, Jeff and I were talking to Cisco in India. We had right. um, a China office. Right, right. I remember had that engaged China adventure. Yeah. You know, um, was, um, you know, you know, the, the, the thesis, I think, was was spot on, right? I mean, yeah. I think, I mean, even today, still, you have the big agency holding companies with these kind of multiple verticals. And they're doing a little bit better job if you followed them, where they've tried to break down the walls. They'll have one healthcare agency. Um, and we happen to have a, a healthcare, a pharma marketing business today. So we, we kind of live in that world. Um, so they're, they're doing a little bit better, but yeah, you know, the, the, the thesis was, was right, I think. And I think obviously it was getting a lot of energy. 
the craziest thing about that deal, is you, and you guys talked about it on another episode, but not history, is how quickly Publis has blew that thing up. I mean, yeah. I, I've actually never seen a buyer so quickly, you know, do the kind of damage they did. And that talk about a disjointed process where the people who ultimately ran it had nothing to do with buying it. I mean, it was really kind of that's that's a lesson in dysfunction uh, for anybody. Um, I mean, well, you couldn't, you couldn't think though that the person who didn't pay enough attention would also be the high bidder. <laughs> well, no, I think it was really the business development. Uh, you know, the, the, they have kind of corporate arms that are, have a mandate to kind of grow, and and uh, and then you know they brought the Atlanta team in very very late. Um, in, in the process, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then, but I, you know, and, and you guys obviously were much more involved. I was just, I had a, yeah. a, a view of it much further, but obviously, you know, losing nationwide and those sorts of things. But yeah, that's, and strategics will do that. They, they, it's one of the reasons why if you, you know, if you can get them to buy there, they do things that are irrational, sometimes motivated. Um, whereas it motivated by not the most purest economic issues, they've got some target to hit, um, you know, they also have obviously tons of liquidity today. So if you can, you can wrangle a strategic, it's very hard in the marketing agency world. It's only gotten harder. That's the one thing, you know, we think a lot about We've been, you know, we obviously still own a bunch of marketing businesses, but we haven't gotten back into the pure agency business yet because the agency holding companies are buying very few there. You'd be better off in some specialty areas. Like you guys are like, I know where you're in e-commerce, you know, some, some healthcare has been better because obviously pharma has been, you know, much more dynamic. So it, it's just something to think through. And the other thing is that people, businesses overall, across all industries are always harder to sell because the assets walk out every day. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I buy a piece of software, you know, and I, I have the tech team, right? No one really cares what my CEO looks like when they, you know, where, they, where he or she you know, does, as long as the software performs. You know, there's no creative element to it. Um, you buy, you know, your Microsoft products because they function, right? Not because, you know, whoever, you know, the, the current yeah, CEO. So it's just a very different dynamic. Um, and so there's always been a bias towards those type of, you know, recurring revenue businesses. You know, now you, people pay a ton of money for them. And, and uh, but, you know, it's, but we've always felt good about people business because someone has to get the work done. You just have to really, you know, make sure you have the alignment and, and that's tricky. It's tricky. So, well, Bruce, if you had told us in that first meeting that if things go according to plan five years later, Jeff and I would be selling into Nike, Turkey, <laughs> yeah. uh, have, have a China office that got voted social media agency of, of the year in China. I mean, you know, the socialists really knew social media. Who knew? <laughs> and, um, and if you had said that, we'd be international, we'd be right. like a bunch of the top uh, Fortune 50 brands. We said, wow, if right. we do that, that would be the best possible outcome. And that was the outcome in the middle right? because of the downturn and all this stuff and you know, a bit of recap, uh, recapitalization and so, some other things. Did the final financial outcome match the level of success we actually had as a agency? Not yeah, I mean, obviously, for I mean, for, you know, for us, it was a it was a fine deal. Like, you know, we always say, like, you know, that we're we're more proud of the ones that we kind of hang in there and kind of persevere through. Um, I mean, obviously, it's always great to celebrate the the big victories, but no, I think it was it was a good outcome. It was a particularly good outcome. There's a reason why people um, rate uh, private most funds by vintage. Because if you were like, uh, if you invested quite a bit in, in the first 18 months of 07 and 08, like we did, and that our fund is still actually going to generate a significant gain of that vintage, that's pretty impressive. So that means we hung in there, you know, we took a few hits like everybody, and then we, you know, we kind of came back and made some good investments. Um, but it's, it, you know, I I realize you can't. I, you know what happened in OA had nothing to do with people on this podcast, right? We had no, we had we didn't contribute to it. We couldn't solve it. So you just yeah. You know, and I think a little bit of the pandemic's that way, right? If you were in the restaurant business, yeah, you couldn't do anything really. Unfortunately, you could pivot. You could be nimble. You could try to get your takeout business. You could build an outside hut. But you know, you know, people that were in digital businesses just severed better over the last year we were fortunate because we didn't have a lot of consumer exposure but you know i, I don't know if it, we weren't smart about it we just we don't really know those industries so it wasn't it wasn't by design as much as it was an area that we're just not that knowledgeable about so yeah you know when you think about um 
you know, you listen to lots of stories on the Spun Mafia podcast. And I, and I know that yep. one of the things I always appreciated about uh, Halyard was um, you were there when we needed you and you were there when you needed to push us, but you really sort of let us run the business. And so probably there were things you heard that you maybe hadn't heard before. I'm sure there's lots of other stories. I'm just curious if there's things you remember or things you heard on that that brought back a memory of those. Five <laughs> well, look, I mean, I'll say the one that I do remember, because you're right, we try to let the groups kind of come together naturally, right? We're, you know, we never went to like integration meetings or, because mm -hmm. that would be unnatural. That would be like your father making sure the children <laughs> all play well together, right? That, you know, that, that's never really a good success. But I do remember, you know, when Jeff reached out to us and you did recall it on one of the sessions, you know, where things were not going well and Jeff was going to fly the coop and we're like, no, 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 that we can't have that happen. So, um, and we had to intervene you know, in an unnatural fashion, but just sometimes we do, right? And we, you know, we have to step in to maybe make some tougher decisions or fill the gap or make some people choices. Um, and we, we always like to say, we don't like to get our information just from one source because it could be very jaded. So we always tell all of our companies, look, you know, we're, you know, we're gonna deal with the CEO, CFO, but you know, if, you know, don't be surprised that one day we pick up the head of sales and we just wanna get a market read or, um, you know, because I just think that that allows us the, to make better decisions. We always say the worst thing for any kind of private investor is not to get the good information because you're basically like, it's like driving without the, the, the odometer and the speedometer, all the things you need, the feedback you need to make the right decisions. Um, and, I, and we were being managed a bit a little bit there, as you know, so, um, and, and we weren't getting, you know, the right inputs. Ultimately, what we peeled back out, as you guys know, was much more successful. It was, mm -hmm. we, yeah. And, and the, the nucleus, the components were there. And there's always some egos and personalities involved in, in these sorts of things. Um, you have to try to, you know, peel that back. But that, that's one thing we learned. And we, you know, you, you know, we hadn't really, that had been the first agency we had owned. We had been in, we had owned other marketing companies. So we're also just much, you know, I like to tell people, we try just not to make the, we make plenty of mistakes. We try not to repeat the same ones over and over again. And so I, I think I would have a slight bias in the agency business of more of a buying a, a core business with kind of much smaller tuck-ins, you know, um, which are, you know, where people clearly weren't, didn't have standalone businesses, but they had capabilities or they had skill sets or they had maybe one client that no one, you know, because I just, I just think, in pure integration, you know, is hard in these, in, in the kind of businesses you run, um, particularly geographically, you know, distant. Um, so I'd, I'd be curious your guys' thoughts, if you guys feel similarly, yeah. about just well, the, the challenge. And Raghu's about to go through it again. So maybe he'll, maybe, you know, maybe the third time he'll, he'll nail it, right? Yeah. yeah um, you know, one thing we learned from that is the A part is easy. It's just money. The M part, uh, of, of m a is where you know it, it, it really comes in especially now in a fairly easy money economy like this um the acquisitions come really easy but the mergers aren't any easier than they ever are because it's a right um regardless um and, well, you, and, you, and you're right though you, you, the a part is easy i tell people all the time i, I don't like to be congratulated on buying saying it means i just paid the most um, yeah. I, I like to be congratulated when I sell something for more than I buy, and that means that it was it was a successful outcome. So. Right? Yeah. No. No. Um, no. Totally. And you know, and you go through it, and like, hey, I'm really conscious of like, uh, you know, what the what the M part looks like. And right. Uh, you learn. And look, part of it is we had some we learned some lessons in 08 and 09 that would ne were never going to be learned unless you experienced them right then. And I, I, absolutely. You know. Absolutely. I, I always tell people like, you know, you know, people ask me how long I'm going to do this for. I'm like, we're very much in a pattern recognition business. And so, you know, we kind of faked our way in the early days and, you know, we made some good decisions. We made some bad decisions, but, you know, and, and the more things I see, the better, you know, partner, board member, value added advisor I can be to companies. I mean, we made a new investment in, you know, in a related area, I actually introduced Jeff to the CEO, a really interesting kind of YouTube brand safety and suitability business. And, you know, we've got 10 things we can help them with immediately because, you know, it's, it is kind of cumulative and, and I'm sure you feel the same way. You're now on, you know, versions 3.0 of, of your own business plans. And, you know, there are some things that you'll get to easily. You'll, you'll find different challenges and different issues. Each business has its own, but, you know, you'll hopefully 
get some more of the basic stuff down, right? And that's that's the whole beauty of it. Well, per your point about you know a, a larger core and then tuck-ins, I think that was one of the takeaways from that, and that's that was probably the big learning from the uh, Publicis um, debacle because um, we were, if I remember right, about forty-two million top line. Uh, I think Moxie who Publicis combined this with was about sixty million top line. So there was clearly a bigger and a smaller agency, but not by a wide right. margin. In reality, when you factored in growth rates, we would have been the same within 18 months, right? Um, because um, they were saying relatively the same, or shrinking a little bit, and we, you know, we, we were picking up in, in growth. Right. So when you combine, what do you do with the two teams? Well, if it's a tuck-in acquisition, yeah, there's one or two, you know, important folks that you look at and you kind of level them up at the same level as it right. as, Top folks over here, and, uh, and and then make some other smart decisions, and uh, keep your best talent. But you know, you, you move forward. When you're talking sixty forty, if you just moved everybody down and over because you couldn't deal with the complexity of the M, because the M was right. too you didn't want to put too much effort in it, you just lost them. Mm. Well, yeah. I, I remember. So I was the I think the only person that didn't go forward right and in, into moxie um and uh i remember it was probably six weeks after i was talking to someone at the um old engage office which you know the the whole i don't know 140 150 people were still at in in atlanta um and the ceo of moxie still hadn't come to meet them yeah i mean this was a month and a half (laughs) and i was like okay she wasn't in she she probably wasn't even consulted on this (laughs) like she she clearly was not Cause that's insane. It's a five minute drive from, yeah, from no, there. I, I hear you. So, and I, and I don't blame her. I mean, I think she probably was forced on her and she had a lot of stuff going on. So that, that truly, but I, I think going back to your point, Bruce, um, I do think there, there ought to be a, a clear lead dog and, and, and finding shops that I think trying to make three the way we did that probably, even though there was a, an, uh, at the Columbus office was really where we were quote unquote headquartered and where the CEO was, I, I think it was made it tougher because right. people didn't really know their lane. Well, Atlanta was really the growth engine. I mean, it was easier. Austin obviously was a much smaller piece of the business and mm-hmm. it was smaller. So that was less of it. But no, you're right. And and each one is a, a little bit of a different formula. And sometimes it depends. We're involved in totally different sector today, some position practice transactions. And, you know, there, the integration is all in the back office, right? You know, if you're a orthopedist or you're a, uh, dermatologist, you're seeing your own patients. You're just hoping that the platform can make the paperwork, the bill collection, uh, the insurance reimbursement, which is kind of the nightmare of that business. So it's just a very different solution set, even though it's a people business, right? You know, and, and, you know, if you get some critical mass, you can do some regional marketing, which most of those, yeah. those kind of practice. So every, every business has a slightly different dynamic. Um, yeah. You know, the one thing also that's really on missing, I mean, the problem is I think the broader consumer still kind of associates private equity with like Mitt Romney and, you know, sort of being dragged through the mud. I mean, what, you know, at the end of the day, we're a liquidity solution for our private businesses that really 25 years ago had no, had no liquidity solution. So if you were in the marketing business, you know, a generation ago, the best you probably would get, could do is you would probably sell it to one of your partners who was younger than you, mm-hmm. you know, you'd get maybe some note and pay it back. So, that's kind of lost off on people that, you know, there's liquidity for you know, entrepreneurs like you, you both that just didn't exist, you know, before the private equity industry. And, and I think, you know, you know, it's a role that we think, you know, fills an important gap and in particular in the physician market, which we they had no, no liquidity options historically, like same thing, kind of junior partner model. So I, I want to pivot a bit into talking sure. a little bit more about the industry, but I do have one, uh, I have an idea for you. Sure. I love always in the idea of business. <laughs> I, I just can't help but think. So you, you take um, Engage and what you had was um, four of us that were entrepreneurs that had started something from scratch, right? So, so you've got entrepreneurs that have been successful. If you had said, hey guys, stay with it for a year and then I'm going to back you starting a new one, maybe in a slightly, you know, maybe focused right. on healthcare or focused on, but, and, and get equity in the next things the four of us did, but you, you, you kept us having some equity in the first thing. And over that year, we helped transition and stuff. I think you'd have made out really well. Yeah, met. for sure. And that's, that's kind of some of the structural issues in the, in the private capital markets, which is, 
our mandate is not to invest in like startups or earlier stage companies, right? So, but mm-hmm. I, I, you know, so I would have been happy to back you, you, you folks. I could have done it a little bit personally, but not enough to kind of make it work worth your while. But that is kind of some of the challenges. And I, we've got, you know, we're always happy to work with our entrepreneurs again. And, and many times what happens is as they grow, like you, you probably actually don't want them. You want, to, you want to take it further along because that's where you actually create the most value. Mm-hmm. So if you can get it far enough along with your money, less outside money, and then, you know, wait to critical mass before you bring an outside partner, it's a better... But that's, yeah. but that's why, but, I mean, but, if you had done that when we first sold, we were 30, I was 31, 32. Yeah, for I sure. Said, I would have said, absolutely. You mean, Bruce, <laughs> you're going to buy this and then in a year I start a new thing and you're going to fund it? I'd have been in. <laughs> no, I hear you. It's, it, it, and, and, and that is honestly, that's what the, the venture growth market does. So, uh, and, and we actually did some early venture investing. It's just a very different discipline. You've actually got to make like 20 investments. You actually have no idea what your, your, where your grand slam is going to be. And the model is one investment is going to return the fund. And out of 20, like five are going to return some money, 10 are going to lose money and 10 are going to be bankrupt. You're not even going to get to that point. So it's, you know, you, you have to have actually a much different discipline approach where we, we tell people, look, we, we're in the business of singles and doubles. And if something really works, then we'll hit a home run. We can make four or five, six times our money, which is great, obviously. But um, we also are just happy to make some singles and doubles because that's, you know, we're, look, we're stewards of capital, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're some some you know version of what fidelity does if we if our returns aren't good our investors are not going to give us more money um so far so good but you know so that's a perfect segue so talk a little bit about private equity um firms what typical returns you are looking for um how long you typically look to hold businesses um you know what you're looking from a risk portfolio no absolutely and and honestly the more the market is really matured so that it's very stratified today so there was a time period where if a private equity business was, if a private equity uh, firm owned a business, you know, you could assume three, four, five years down the road, it was going to be sold. And that's probably the typical time frame. In a hot market like we are today, average holds are down. People are in something, they've made money in two or three years. They're like, okay, you know, you know, trees don't grow to the sky. We might want to sell this. So we're on the shorter end. We've owned a business for, I don't know, I think nine years. Um, and there are some funds set up with perpetual capital that they, they like to own businesses where they would like to make an investment and think it's a great long-term trying to own it for 20 years. But I'd say the average is, is three, four, five. And, um, you know, our returns are, our expectations are lofty. We're trying to make, you know, a 20% return. And we're trying to make probably two to three times every dollar invested back. I'd say return expectations, they won't, talk about it publicly, most of the big firms, because they've come down. I mean, rates are down. Um, so most of the big firms, if they make 12 or 14%, they're totally happy. And, and, I, and we all know in our own portfolios, we make 10% for it's static. We, I think where everyone's looking at their year-end statements and they're thinking, wow, I, the markets really are crazy. We made money last year in a pretty significant way by doing nothing, by just buying the S&P 500. So, um, so it, it's, in, it's in that order of magnitude. There's so many different styles though. You've got everything, I think of it as a continuum, everything from like seed, you know, which is like an idea on a napkin to really mature cash flowing buyouts. And there's probably 20 years ago, there was 10 flavors, you know, 10 years ago, there was 10 more. And now there's probably 50 and people are deep specialists. And so in our world, you know, we, we stick to three or four sub industries, right? We stick to marketing, we stick to IT, things that we really know about because at the end of the day, we have a better probability of being successful if we've got a little bit of, you know, perspective on the industry and it's hard. So, but, you know, and, and, you know, and KRG as an example, obviously Mountain Gate now, you know, they, you know, they've got investment, you know, history as well. And so they've, they've, you know, that's, that's part of the premise and you've got to pivot. That's the other thing. I'm sure you, you feel the same thing about your business. We used to own radio stations and TV stations. If we stayed in that marketplace, um, we would be long out of business. So, that hasn't made sense for a good, you know, 18 years, but we used to own them and they were, we actually made good money on them. Um, so, you know, part of our exercise is like, what's next, right? And, and even in the agency world, the agencies really have a very different flavor to them. There are very few kind of basic creative and, you know, uh, kind of production type agencies that you would have maybe seen before. Um, they're, they're all skinned differently. They're e-commerce or they're around an ecosystem like, uh, you know, Salesforce or, you know, where, 
there's a particular you know dynamic there but um but it's it's you know it's a broad industry and I, i'd say the good news for entrepreneurs is there's pretty much a home for almost everybody if they have size i would say and i would say minimum size you know you have to have a business that's worth i'd say at least 20 million dollars ish you know if you're going to be the platform maybe yeah that would be the super small size um you know and look if you're a SaaS business that could be you know five million dollars of arr so you know it just depends on what what business model you have but um there's a lot of capital out there so it's it's a good time to be an entrepreneur for sure ragu when when you just went through the process i know what the uh the, how the I just would want to share how valuations work in our industry, um, and and what multiples you think are out there, and see if Bruce agrees. So Jeff asked a question that I really shouldn't be talking about on the call right after. You can talk about ranges. You can, right? you can talk it in generality, and I can be specific, Regu, because uh, <laughs> yeah. you know you know I, I've been outbid on five things in the last three months. So perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there's ultimately for a digital agency, there's kind of two guide rails that you stay in between in the valuation, um, taking a look at multiple of EBITDA, and then also have, you have to make sense on a multiple of revenue basis because one can get whacked. You know, if you've got some anomaly in your figure and you're, you know, you're a good agency, you haven't generated a lot of revenue yet, but I mean, a lot of profit yet, but you have good revenue. There's still value there because, you know, you can take a, take right. a look at it. Or you're a highly tuned agency on EBITDA. And I think, um, um, 44, definitely, we were very mature on populations. We had like a great team on understanding how to optimize and make the best of what we had. Um, then you could say, hey, you're, um, if you look at purely at EBITDA, you're like, whoa, you know, that's, that's great. But, you know, you, you, you do need to have a foot in the ground of saying, hey, you're not paying, you know, three plus X on revenue on a services business. So I think, you know, taking a look at multiple of revenue of um, and multiple of EBITDA, and then that triangulates to what Bruce is going to talk about because I'm not going to say any specific. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think. Look, I think. We're, and I would just add. What, there's two other elements I think have become increasing for. One is revenue growth, and, and particularly gross margin growth because people are paying for growth today. Yeah. Um, and so they'll, they'll be they'll be happy if you were growing gross margin dollars at 20 percent and EBITDA less because you were investing in sales. You can get credit for that today. And we have a cyber business and yeah, that business has been really, that's the primary metric. The other thing is gross margin percentage is becoming hugely uh, important because it actually says a lot about the operating leverage in the business. Um, we, we really like these businesses where the, with high gross margins, our farmer marketing company has gross margins like in the mid seventies. Um, and which means that they're, they're not, they're not leveraging people necessarily to do, they, they do some data and targeting. They have a kind of, proprietary stack, um, and which means also I can invest a ton in marketing and salespeople because I can pay them a bunch because the incremental client is worth, you know, 75 cents for every dollar revenue I generate. Um, but yeah, the, the multiples are, are, you know, I'd say on, on the EBITDA side, you know, they're, they're dipping into the double digits. I mean, for the bigger businesses, there was a, a trade, just a couple weeks ago, a big, big healthcare agency called Finger Paint. You know, we bid for in the first round, like 13 times and didn't get a meeting. So it, we're assuming it went north of that. Um, you know, when you get to be sub 5 million of EBITDA, that's part of the premise, by the way, is why you do these, these aggregation plays. Sub 5 million of EBITDA, I think you're still in the kind of six, seven, eight times EBITDA range with like, like Regu says, kind of a check on revenue. But the, you know, but then you have companies like Moat, <laughs> which is, uh, um, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, a safety validation fraud detection software business. Oracle paid like eight hundred million dollars for it and didn't have any EBITDA. So, it, it, depending on where you you sit in that world, but I'd say in the agency world, yeah, you're still generally EBITDA driven. The big thing in the agency world on deal structures is that if you sell to the holding companies and you're an entrepreneur, you get these kind of massive long term earnouts, as you, as you know, um, and they're very hard to manage. So they'll they'll, they'll go five, six, seven years sometimes. Um, which is not that attractive to some people where at least, you know, when you're, when you're partnering with a private equity firm, they, the, the buyers know that that's not something that's viable. <laughs> so um, you, you kind of get away from that structure, but that operating leverage is key. It's even key. I think as people think about how the agency business is going to evolve anywhere, you can get some technology, software tools 
that will allow you to, instead of having to do what we used to have to do, like every time we want a new piece of business, find five more people to execute it. If you can use, you know, software and obviously e-commerce is great for that because whether the people are, you're getting a percentage of, of gross spend, right? CPV, you know, you're, you're going to, you know, if you can drive those, those average transaction prices for, for your clients, you know, you can drive more value. We've been a big believer in performance advertising forever. And I think you kind of put your money where your mouth is, you know, our, our very first business we invest in the space. So I sold four times and finally got sold to a big strategic, you know, it's, and it's a great story. We, we bought it out of bankruptcy in 03 for 10 million. We sold it four and a half years later for 185. So we thought we were like geniuses. We were, we were happy. We made 12 times our money. It's our all time record on, it got sold four subsequent times and, and Willis, the big insurance company bought it last year for $1.4 billion. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I'm not unhappy, you know, if I, but, you know, it just shows that when you're in the right part of the market and yeah, I don't know if you followed what's happening in kind of consumer insurance, but it's become a, you know, a marketing business where historically it was all three agents. So it really disrupted, you know, and obviously we, collectively, I know you used to, you know, the, we used to do a lot of work for Nationwide, but that's the perfect example where it's, it's all gone direct to consumer with much more sophisticated tactics. Yeah, and I think ultimately, at least on the, uh, you know, when you're talking about these kind of firms, um, being a generalist agency is going to be the bulk you would need to be considered something that to be acquired is right. quite, quite large. Really what they're buying is size at that point, um, market share or size. Whereas yeah. when you actually have a specialty and it's, you pick the right kind of specialty, kind of, you get a lot of high leverage because you then could get tucked into a company that could then bring that service to a much broader set of customers, right? Yeah. So what they're willing to pay for you versus what they can get out of you as a really good delta because um, they can take your skill sets, take your reach and bring it to a pretty wide audience. Um, yep. The, um, you know, um, that said, when this, this call ends, we can talk more, Bruce. Um, <laughs> well, we, sure, we are getting... good, did a good, good job negotiating, so I'm sure you got a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are getting toward the end. I, I, I don't want to end without um, giving some advice to our entrepreneur friends that listen to this um, that have dreams of selling one day. And, and most of them are going to be in the space that we've been talking about. So um, right. I'll, I'll take advice starting with Bruce, but from either of you on like, what would you recommend to entrepreneurs to make, make themselves a, an attractive business for private equity? Yeah. I mean, I think, look, first of it is, is uh, just be prepared, right? <laughs> I think the hardest thing for the first time people kind of approach the institutional market is, you know, really kind of do your homework and get your information because, you know, we're, you know, we're information and data driven. We want to see, you know, revenue by month by client because we, you know, we like to hear the strategy and the talk over, but if the numbers match the, you know, the dialogue, then it's even more compelling. So I say that's the biggest thing out of the gate is take a little bit extra time. You know, look, you're good. I would recommend as much as, you know, against my interest, you know, hire a good investment bank. I know you, you've both talked about that historically. I don't know right who you use this time, but, uh, um, but I don't know if you use that media again, but yeah, there's, there's, you know, I think they just, how they, they've been, they've seen the movie enough times to get you prepared and then really try to figure out, put, put yourself in the shoes of the investor, because I think, you know, the, the best deals I always feel like are win-win, <laughs> you know, you want your investor to make money. We want the entrepreneur to make more money. Um, and, you know, try to understand, you know, where you want to take the business because I think so many people kind of come in and say, yeah, we want to sell. We want to stay. No, we don't want to stay. We, we'd actually like to check out. Okay. Well, what are we left with? You know, and that's a big issue. Like, you know, and, and, and a perfect example when, when Jeff told us he, he wasn't going to continue with engage, that we at least planned around it. I know mean, you talked about that on one of the podcasts. So, um, it's way harder to sell a business with key people leaving. So if that's, that's part of your plan and, you know, maybe you're at that age in life where um, you want that to happen, you should put that plan into motion years ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Some, some yep. sort of, you know, kind of, you know, continuity, legacy, succession, you know, it's really a, an important component, but you know, that, that's the, that's the big thing. Be, be realistic. I mean, um, I think, you know, you just have to approach the market, you know, we kind of, it's, it's okay if you don't get something done or you don't get to the number you're, you're happy, happy with, that's fine. But, you know, it's, it's, as you, you both know, it's time consumptive, right? It's an, it's an exhaustive all in process. And, you know, you're trying to find shelf space against 
10,000 other businesses that are also trying to raise capital. So, you know, trying to find your, your piece of the world that'll connect with you um, is, is going to take some effort. So that, that's just a few thoughts. Raghu, what do you think? You've done it a few times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, ultimately, if you're not attractive to your clients, you're not going to be attractive to a buyer of the company as a whole. So, yeah. you know, you can kind of line up the right metrics of running your firm as far as attracting new clients. And, you know, if you're in demand from clients, you'll be in demand in the macro sense from investors. That's it. I think there's two pieces. Um, you, they say not to do market timing for individual stocks. And, you know, that's, that's really hard. When was the right time to sell Tesla? You know, um, you should have sold it any time over the last several years. And exactly. You would, have, you would have been fine. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, so marketing, t- market timing for stocks and stuff is extremely hard. But for your business, you're thinking like a stochastic thing. I have one stock, which is my company, and I should time as best as possible. So if you have a sustainable business and you're in a downturn, you're like, hey, I can, it's sustainable. I can pull through this downturn. I know the right levers to pull to kind of preserve some capital and come back through. And there's an economic cycle at the end of the day. You know, right now, I guess the seven year economic cycle sort of gone to hell. You would have thought that in 2015, we'd have a recession. But, um, you know, we've had this kind of nonstop kind of boom since coming out of the last downturn. But ultimately, if you're strong enough, you can handle a bit of a downturn and not have to sell into a weaker market and keep operating your business well and, and come back on the other side. And survivors do even better on the upside because some of your competitors didn't make it through. So suddenly you have some green field, fewer competitors. You start having some, as the market goes up, you do better than the market because you, you've come through. And then you really can time the sale. Now, if you wait till you're in your 60s and you want to time it for retirement, you pretty much peg that you're going to time, sell it on a specific date and not regardless of what the market is doing. And you've pinned yourself into a tough situation. But I think flexibility and being able to sustain through a downturn and, and show it can really help maximize outcomes. You know, we sold really, I guess, your LOI. Bruce came in you know, October, November of 20. November 1st, we signed. November yeah. 1st, yeah. Yeah, and then March 18th, I think, um, you know, the uh, uh, transaction. April April 2018 was like the best month ever. <laughs> uh, um, but we almost missed the market. I mean, Bear Stearns collapsed yeah. in February. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure, I don't know if you guys were, were, if it was yet kind of aware yet how kind of volatile the markets were. I, I think we still were probably not that aware of it ourselves. Um, it really took us to like May, June until we really started to get nervous. Actually, Bruce, I do remember one data point. Is this true? In December of 17, you guys normally used um, like some sort of Maryland, like, mid-market lending group and that got acquired by General Electric Finance. Yeah. Um, which was sort of like a early warning sign that like maybe Merrill was like trying to raise ca- capital or. Yeah, something. no, maybe, maybe, but they did get acquired. Yeah. I still actually yeah. deal with that guy. So he's um, at another shop now. He's at, a, he's at another bank. So. And, and it's a little backtracing, but roughly when our book went out hard and we were really talking to everybody in August, I think that's when um, one of Goldman's money market funds broke the buck. Um, so should I? So the real question, Raku, is should I short the market now that you've sold again? Because I believe it or not, I have. You know, there was another entrepreneur. Um, he sold when we bought your business. We bought his business, um, one of his education lead gen business. And he he actually went back it again. He sold his second business. There was called Quote Wizard. That sold to Lenny Tree. It's a big player insurance. And so you know, same thing. You know. When, when smart people like you sell, I'm, I'm, I may have to just go short the market, you know, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe that's my best, maybe, maybe that's my best tip today. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I'd moderate that with the old adage of don't fight the Fed. Um, if they're willing to dump a few trillion dollars more into the economy, I think we've got a couple of years left. All right. So um, any, I'm going to give Bruce the final word here. Is there any parting thoughts, uh, anything you want to add on either our story with you or. It's been honestly, like I said, this is, I mean, as far as your story, I mean, it's been just honestly, you know, a true pleasure and honor to get to know, you know, you guys and, and Danny and, 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 um, and Raj and, you know, 
it, you know, and, and, and the rest of the engaged team. And honestly, that's what each one of those learning experiences kind of builds upon, you know, what, what you do next in life. So honestly, I'm, I've been doing this long enough that thankfully I, I, I really do only work with people who I have a general personal chemistry and affection for. And I, I have that for you guys. And look, it's, it's, I say it all the time. I mean, you know, every week somebody new comes in with a great idea. And, and so that's the, that's the great, I mean, the, the, there are lots of issues in our country today. Entrepreneurship is not one of them. We're, I think we still really, you know, lead the world in that category. And, and so I'm always learning from some new entrepreneur, um, whether it's marketing or some other sector. And so it's, you know, so I always encourage people have, have the conversation, um, you know, and, and, you know, look, I, even, even, you know, the conversation you, you folks had with your advisory board, that was, I found that interesting that, you know, you kind of rope them in lightly compensated. Um, and, uh, you know, they were, they were sage people. And I try to give back in that way too. I mean, I do a lot of mentoring and, and uh, honestly, it's, it's a ton of fun. I now have a son who's in the private equity business. So I've told him it's time for him to step up his game. So, you know, I can really retire and, uh, you know, focus on the true fun stuff. But um, anyway, it was, it was really great to reconnect with you guys. And I'm, I'm hopefully we'll be traveling again soon. So I can, we'll, we'll get to see each other in Atlanta or New York. That would be great. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us, Bruce. We really yeah. appreciate it. No problem. Have a good day.